Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Louise. <coughs> Excuse me. And hello to everyone. Um, as Louise uh, said, first of all, I am going to be giving you uh, a kind of a brief overview of our whole map collection uh, in the local and family history department at the Central Library before spending another 10 minutes or so talking you some of, through some of my favourite maps in our collection. Oh, excuse me, <clears throat> in our collections, focusing particularly on some of our oldest local maps. But first, as I said, an overview of our local history map collection at the Central Library as a whole. And I want to start with one fact. Well, it's not really a fact as such, but I think it's almost certainly undeniable. And that is that maps are brilliant. Uh, I think we can probably all agree with Dora the Explorer on that, as well as being seriously and endlessly fascinating in their own right maps are one of the most important of what we might call the second rank of resources for local and family historians that is maps aren't necessarily the very first place you would start doing your research though that depends of course on the specific research you are doing instead you're usually more likely to begin using resources such as census records and primary or secondary descriptions of events but maps are a definite and very essential part of the next step, which is contextualizing the places that your ancestors lived or the area an event took place in. There's just no substitute for seeing for yourself the locale where people made their homes, the neighborhoods where they lived their lives, the surroundings that can make sense of why an event happened there and not somewhere else. So, what maps do we hold in the local and family history department that can help you on that journey? The answer is many hundreds of maps, but almost certainly uh, thousands, in fact, uh, mainly covering Leeds, but also a very substantial collection covering the rest of Yorkshire too. And that collection is, broadly speaking, split into two particular uh, different types of categories. First of all, Ordnance Survey or OS maps, like the one you can see on the screen now, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes and also non-ordnance survey maps, like the one on the slide now. Certainly the most detailed maps that we hold are the aforementioned ordnance survey maps. These have been produced at fairly regular intervals since about 1850. And, and this is to keep things, uh, keep things pretty simple. That includes three main scales, three main levels of detail. Uh, I'll just take you through those now, because I do think it's worth anybody here who's unfamiliar with these different kinds of ordnance survey maps, uh, just getting an idea of how useful they can be. Starting with the uh, six inch to one mile OS series, this series covers the entirety of Yorkshire in our collections with large areas covered by a single sheet. As you can see on the screen with the map, we just saw as an example of an OS map. This is the famous, uh, famous to us librarians at least, given how often we have to get this out for our customers, uh, the famous sheet 218, which shows all of Leeds town centre and much of the outlying areas to the south and east, at least as they were when surveyed in about 1850. And while these six inch maps are surprisingly detailed on a general level, as you can see from this zoomed in view, which shows the sheep's cart area, what you don't get there really is a kind of extra uh, a detail that allows you to make sense of a very specific localised neighbourhood in any real detail, i.e. not all of the streets are named and individual buildings in a street can be hard to make out uh, on a map of this level. These maps are more for getting a general sense of wide areas and how they relate to one another, where the main landmarks and roads are, that sort of thing. Um, there's a gap in this series after that initial set in the 1850s uh, until 1890, when the series starts again and continues to the present day. Next up is the 25 inch to one mile OS series. The example on the screen shows part of the centre of Leeds, including Sheep's Car again. Hopefully you can pretty instantly see how much more detail you get on this map than on the one we've just seen, the six inch map of the same area. Zooming in a bit shows us that even more clearly. Uh, smaller street names are now given, and though you can't, I don't think there are necessarily any examples of this on this section, names of uh, smaller areas like yards are also given at this scale, uh, as well as a lot more information about building usage. There still isn't enough detail on these uh, maps to have house numbers listed, but you can make out individual buildings in a street, so that means you can use these maps alongside resources such as trade directories to work out the exact location of people and buildings. 
This sequence started in the early 90s and new maps uh, were published roughly every kind of 10 years until the late 1930s, picking up again in the 1960s and continuing again to the present day. Uh, we hold physical copies of this series at the Central Library that cover all of Leeds, most of West Yorkshire, uh, with patchy coverage for the rest of Yorkshire. Third, in this very brief overview, is the uh, 50 inch to one mile series, oh, excuse me. Um, this series covers the second half of the 20th century and beyond, uh, up to the, again, up to the present day. You can see an example of uh, one of these maps on the screen now. This shows the area around Leeds Bridge going up to the bottom section of Brigate. Uh, and here's a zoomed in view, which focuses on the junction of Ball Lane, Brigate and Duncan Street, uh, roughly from, uh, well, just beyond the Holy Trinity Church in the west to the Corn Exchange in the east. These are our most detailed modern maps and are particularly notable for featuring building and house numbers. Uh, our physical collection covers the Leeds Metropolitan District only, and these date from the 1950s, as I said, uh, until today, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, finally, in terms of uh, our OS maps, we also have two very detailed but uh, temporally specific series, the five foot to one mile and 10 foot to one mile maps of the centre of Leeds and the areas immediately bordering. An example of the five foot to one mile map series can be seen on the screen now, while on this slide, we have an example of the 10 foot to one mile series. While both these series are very detailed, they are, as I've said, restricted both geographically, they only cover the center of Leeds, and in terms of time period, the five foot to one mile maps only cover 1850, and the 10 foot to one mile maps, a 20 year period between 1889 and 1911. Both of the series are, however, extremely useful because they're very, very detailed uh, if your research or interest covers Leeds itself in those periods. As for non-OS maps, these maps are usually those produced for a one-off uh, or specific purpose, a category that includes everything from historical maps, such as this very nice map showing the area 10 miles around Leeds from 1797 non-OS and indeed I suppose pre-ordnance survey maps focusing on the whole of Leeds itself uh, like this one from 19, uh, 1834 rather maps of urban improvement and utilities for example this map showing proposed improvements to Ball Lane uh, from 1866 and maps of very specific purpose such as this 1934 map showing so-called slum clearance areas these maps are always interesting to look at, I think, but they may not always seem useful for local historians or other researchers, unless you happen to be looking at that very specific subject area. Uh, however, it's worth just bearing in mind that maps can contain fascinating material outside of their original purpose, i.e. a map might not, from its title, seem like it would be useful for your research, uh, but may prove to be so once physically looked at. One example of this is from a recent blog by family historian Sarah Lee, in which she describes how just recently I was looking at a cop of a 1699 map. It had been drawn to show the position of salt works in a Cumbrian manner. It wasn't that I was interested in the Cumbrian salt industry like its creator, but I was particularly interested in the manner and the villagers shown. So it's important to remember that a map created for one reason may be useful in many ways. Most of our non ordnance survey map series at the Central Library isn't on our public our digital catalogue. You can really only see what we have by browsing our physical card catalogue in the department. Of course, that's not uh, completely an option at present, as the department is uh, really only open at the moment for uh, bookable appointments. Uh, but thankfully, uh, pre-lockdown, we had... Uh, completed typing up the map series from the card catalog onto a spreadsheet. And there's an example of that spreadsheet on the part of that spreadsheet on the screen. That spreadsheet can be emailed out to customers if you're interested in seeing uh, our full collection of uh, local maps. Just ask us using the contact details on the screen now. And I think um, these contact details will be shown uh, later on in the presentation as well. That's about it for the kind of the overview anyway of our map collection. You can get a fuller picture of the local map collection at the Central Library through our research guide, Maps of Leeds and Yorkshire, which is available on our secret library blog. The URL for that can be seen just to the right. We can also send one of these out to people. Again, just ask us using the contact details on the screen now. 
I'm sure we will have some questions about our map collection, but for now I shall introduce, I shall <clears throat> lead on to introducing you to some of my favorite local history maps in the department before handing over to my colleagues. Um, my selections are three fairly early maps and one related set from the last five years or so. Um, I'll just get to just quickly drink some water, just a second. Right, let's make a start. Okay, so I start with this <clears throat> early 16th century map entitled a map of Rothwell, Alton and Lofthouse made in the reign of Henry VIII. This is in fact our very oldest local map. Uh, and until relatively recently, this map was catalogued by us as simply being from the 1500s. But we've recently discovered that the actual map date, the date of the map has been hiding in plain sight really since the 1990s uh, in a 1991 article in the uh, Yorkshire Archaeological Society Journal by R.W. Hoyle. The article reproduces the map in full and provides extensive background and contextual detail for the map and what it actually shows, uh, explaining that it was drawn up by officers of the Crown as part of a legal dispute between Thomas Lord Darcy of Tem Temple Newsome and local villagers in Rothwell and its surrounding area. I have to admit that some of the intricate details of that dispute as laid out by Hoyle escape me, but I'll try my best to summarise it for you now. <clears throat> so basically, after receiving a grant from Henry VIII of Rothwell's former manorial hunting park in 1509, Darcy proceeded to improve the wooded parkland by converting some of its overgrown woodland into land for the growing of crops. That conflicted with the apparent rights of villagers to use the park as common grazing ground for their cattle. By 1526, locals were objecting to Darcy's activities, and in 1531, a court ruled that Darcy had to provide a certain amount of land for the villagers for that purpose, land separated from the improved land, which was then enclosed by hedging, ditches and fences. That ruling, however, did not seem to satisfy the villagers who continued to lay claim to larger areas of land for cattle grazing. Uh, this dispute came to a head on the 3rd of May 1532, when 250 men and women from Rothwell and the surrounding areas proceeded to tear down the fences Darcy's men had erected. The conflict was eventually resolved, however, in Darcy's favour, when courts ruled that villagers involved in the riots should be fined in order to, this is a quote, restrain any of their neighbours who were moved to wreck Darcy's Park again. Um, our copy of the map is a sanctioned photocopy from the original held at the National Archives, uh, making this map accessible for local people in the Rothwell and Leeds area. Hoyle dates the map to 1531. It was drawn up by the court that made that initial ruling in that year that local villagers should have parkland set aside to satisfy their ancient grazing rights. Hoyle explains as well that this map is probably the oldest extant map for the whole of the West Riding. So while the map was initially produced for a legal dispute, it remains useful for a wider audience and is an example of that process we talked about earlier how maps produced for very specific purposes in their own time can have an afterlife of continued usage long after their original purpose has passed. In this case, for instance, the map provides all kinds of uh, detail about the makeup of a 16th century West Riding village community. My next map is rather similar, and that is this one, the 1560 map of Leeds, the first map of Leeds proper. I'm sure many of you will have seen this map before, and many of you will also know its purpose. Um, again, it was drawn up as part of a legal dispute, this time between the tenants of the Queen's Mill and Thomas Falkenham of the North Hall Manor, which had been carved out of the manor of Leeds itself in the 12th century. The current tenants of the Queen's Flour Mill which was a soak mill, that is one with a local monopoly obliging all tenants of the manor to grind their corn there. These tenants allege that they had suffered financial injury on the erection of a corn mill near to Falkenham's Hall, situated around the corner of Vicar Lane and Lady Lane. Falkenham, for his part, claimed it was within his rights to build and operate his own mill, given his mill stood within his own manor of North Hall. This map was then drawn up by commissioners investigating that dispute and is intended to be a true and perfect record of the situation of the said mill and stream. 
The map was instead a rather rude sketch, as Edmund Wilson remarks in his 1899 Thorsby Society article on the case, with no pretense to accuracy. Still, as Wilson himself acknowledges, it remains interesting as the earliest known map of the town. The east is actually at the top of the map, as was not unusual in olden times, again, according to Wilson. So here it is rotated, making the perspective a little bit more familiar to us today. The river area is at the bottom here, flowing west to east, or east to west, um, uh, <clears throat> spanned by a, a bridge from which Brigate extends northwards until it reaches upper and lower head row. Just below the latter, we find Falkenham's Hall and his mill, both now circled. And circled now in the southwest corner is the Queen's Mill itself. Interestingly and revealingly, perhaps, the map does not show the parish church, but it does show two other mills, evidence perhaps of the commissioner's true area of interest here. That is, less in drawing an accurate plan of the town than in creating a visual inventory of the matter at the heart of this legal and commercial dispute. And that's important because it reminds us that strangely, maps aren't often what we necessarily mean when we talk about maps, that is objective scientific records of space and place. As family historian Sophie Kay has said, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking of maps as an unbiased resource that somehow map makers should always have set down the vision in front of them as it stood. So that is, instead of being neutral and unbiased, maps always reflect the perspectives of the, of the societies that produce them much more than they depict any physical reality. Map makers seek to impose order onto chaos, setting limits onto space, in doing so, they define the boundaries of inclusion and exclusion from certain spheres of activities and for certain social groups. In this sense, their maps are essentially about knowledge, control and power, struggles over which lie at the heart of all politics. Maps are, I would say, always political. That's certainly the case with the two maps we've just looked at, which are essentially about land ownership, who has it and who is claiming it. And that's also the case with the next map I want to look at, Another one that many of you will be familiar with, John Cousin's very famous 1726 map of Leeds entitled A New and Exact Plan of the Town of Leeds. And of course, this is very much not an exact plan of the town or a fully accurate vision of how Leeds really was during the early 18th century. Instead, it's a map defined much more by its border images, the grand homes of those cloth merchants who paid for the map to be made together with visual representations of the commercial and social spaces important to those elites and their networks, their churches, their cloth halls, their bowling greens, and so on. Notably absent from the map, however, is any representation of the homes and workshops of the poorer members of society. Instead, Cousins largely and simply cross shades uh, huge areas, and in the process erases the meaningful existence of non-elite people in Leeds at this time. A reflection, no doubt, of prevailing attitudes among their so-called social betters, those merchants who funded the map's production. And that's why I like my final set of maps, which is a selection from our Riot Map collection. This collection of maps were originally created by Tim Waters for a website of the same name in 2016 and plot the locations of protests and demonstrations throughout Leeds's history. These range from the broadly familiar, for example, the 1643 Battle of Brigate on the screen now, to less well-known struggles, such as the 1753 Turnpike Riots, through the Chartist demonstrations of the 19th century, and even on to late 20th century protests or disturbances, such as those taking place between 1975 and 2001. These riot maps are important, I think, because... While the other maps we've looked at are rather coy about their subjectivity, their roots in structures of power and legal control, these maps actively foreground those social systems by focusing on instances where individuals or groups have acted to break, subvert or overthrow those chains of hierarchy. The riot maps make social inequalities explicit and unavoidable. In contrast to Cousins, for instance, whose map conceals the urgent realities of urban life, that is conflict, conflict and negotiation between different social groups, the rich and the poor. The Riot Map series brings to the fore the experiences of the unheard and the unseen, 
revealing exactly what is missing from so many other cartographical representations of Leeds past. In doing so, the riot maps disrupt conventional approaches to map politics and history, mainstreaming a history of protest rather than a history of power, and drawing attention to the socially constructed nature of all maps in the process. They show us in short that history and the cartography, the maps underpinning many of the stories we tell about the past, is entirely a matter of contested meanings, both then and now. And that's where I finish. I shall now hand you back to Louise and thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much there, Anthony. Um, just give me a moment and I will start sharing my screen. Okay, uh, Anthony, I'm just gonna ask you, are you able to see the my first map there? Yep. Brilliant, okay then. Off we go. So hi everyone, I'm going to talk to you about the Zoological and Botanical Garden map, which is an 1837 map in our collection. And it's a map of what could have been, not what actually was. So the Zoological and Botanical Gardens were also known as the Headingley Zoo and later known as the Royal Gardens. They opened in 1840, were sold in 1848 and closed in 1858. For those short 18 years that they were around, the one consistency was that they may, remained largely in a lot of debt and were never commercially viable. So the map you can see here, it was drawn by William Billington in 1837. And while this slide is up, and it's gonna be up for a while, I want you to kind of familiarize yourself with the shape of the map, especially the pointy bit at the top, because we'll come back to that at the end. So around the late 1830s, England is in a period of post-industrialization and people have noticed the lack of green spaces, especially green spaces that can be used by the working classes. Parliamentary select committees have started to recommend that we build more public parks and the way they think we should do this is either by increasing rates or going down the voluntary subscription model. So the uh, zoological and botanical gardens went down the voluntary subscription method route. Now, the plan was that they had to raise over £10,000, but not more than £20,000. And once they reached the sum of £7,500, they were going to start building. So this was the site that was chosen, and it was in Headingley, selected for its proximity to the city centre, but also because they felt it was very suitable for a garden of this type. Now, it was designed by civil engineer William Billington, the man who drew this map, and he was aided by groundworks and botanist ground in the groundworks by botanist and landscape gardener Edward Davies. Now, the plan was they would have an orangery, uh, many greenhouses, conservatories for palms and another one for fruits. There would be a large fountain, exotic plants and birds, zoological specimens. There would be a lake island, including a rustic bridge and another lake for a waterfowl, for waterfowl to live on. There would also be a grand entrance at the Bur Grand Entrance Lodge at the Burley side of the park. Um, this park was designed to rival those of Edinburgh and Kew Gardens. This was going to be the cherry on the top of the cake that was Leeds. Now, unfortunately, that didn't quite pan out because the park and gardens were hit by one issue after another. The first of these being that during the planning stage, it was suggested that a park should not be open on the Sabbath. That day should be kept solely for worship. Um, unfortunately, the only day of the week that the working classes had off work when they could visit a park was a Sunday. So immediately we see this clash of who the park was originally planned for and who would actually get to use it. Because of this, people no longer wanted to subscribe. Originally, they were, the rich were happy to subscribe because they were doing something for the working classes, something that would open up all these green spaces. But as soon as it seemed that this park would not be used by the working classes, they were no longer willing to put up as much money. Now, the park's second big issue arrived in 1838. Again, it still hasn't opened, but at this point, one, its first building is now destroyed by fire along with all of the tools used in creating the park and the workshop. So this, along with the reduced funding, creates a huge issue in, is this park ever going to actually happen? A newspaper report in 1838 tells us that at this point, 
we have the surrounding wall covering the whole park. We have two ponds, one of which is an acre and the other is half an acre wide. Nearly all of the walks were formed. Um, we also have the Burley Entrance Lodge. We have the Porter's Lodge cottages. We have the committee room and a shed, and we have a propagation house. But we do not have many of these amazing glass buildings that you see around the outside of this map that was supposed to be built. Um, at this point, costs are spiralling. Um, the park took, the grounds took a lot more draining than they'd originally thought, and that was eating up money. And at one point, it was even considered, should they just hand the site over to the Church of England to be used as a graveyard? However, the people running it decided, no, we're going to give it a go. And in October, no, in July 9, 1840, the park opened. It opened to adults at a cost of sixpence and it opened to children and servants at a cost of threepence. So this park was not free to use. Um, it had been built with subscription money and the idea was that it would maintain its costs through people paying to enter the park. Now, in October 1840, it saw its first major event. This was the one that was going to kick it off and show how amazing this park could be at doing exhibitions and galas and this kind of thing. The plan was, Mr. Rosam, an aeronaut, was to ascend from the park in his balloon and the following week there would be a huge fireworks display. However, third issue, there are no gas pipes located in this part of Headingley at the time they wanted to do this. So the updated plan was that the balloon would be um, inflated at the Cardigan Arms Inn and then it would be floated to the gardens. However, it took so long for them to inflate the balloon that people just left and the whole event had to be cancelled and postponed for a later event, a later date. So over the next eight years, the gardens did go on to hold many galas. There was a lot, many balloonings, successful. I'm not entirely sure where they got the gas from, but they were successful ones. Um, there were many fireworks displays. There were also international events with performers coming from around the world to perform here. However, the park still was not financially viable. So eventually the decision was made they would open the park on Sundays and this would hopefully boost visitation. However, it would only open after morning worship and after evening worship. And you could not turn up to buy your ticket at the time. You had to buy it earlier in the week. So this was not a wake up Sunday morning, go to church, oh, shall we visit the park? No, if you didn't already have your ticket, you weren't going. So again, stifling their opportunities for visitation. However, by this point, they do have attractions. They have got monkeys, they have a raccoon, they have an alligator, four guinea pigs, an owl, a peacock, two parrots, swans and an eagle, and were a very well-bred, decently behaved brown bear all appearing at the gardens. Um, this was reported in the newspaper, so this wasn't reported as a soon to come. This was a reported as a these things are here. So we do believe that all of these animals were there at some point. Now, in 1848, the park has got into such financial problems that it has to be sold and it goes up to auction and it's sold by another businessman who still tries to run it as a park. Um, over the next 10 years, it is again sold and again sold and again sold, but nobody is able to make this park commercially viable. So ultimately by 1858, the park was closed for the last time and sold off for in smaller chunks for building plots. So one last look at that map where you can see that top pointy bit and I'm gonna to switch to a modern Google map. Um, now at the top of the screen, you should see that same pointy outline. What we've got here is a modern today Google map. You can see Headingley Stadium at the bottom, just for a bit of reference there. And what we've done is we've outlined where the botanical and zoological gardens would have been if they were still there today. Now, what's interesting is that by now, Headingley has become very urban. Um, you can see lots of close in houses, lots of terraced houses. Yet, if you follow the line along the middle of the screen, you can still see um, Cardigan Lane there but you can see all this greenery around it. And this is sort of some of the last remaining surviving Greenland that would have been the parkland. Um, the two lakes have gone, the walkways have gone, but instead those building plots that are mostly now large houses that have either been turned into offices or flat accommodation, that's kind of the end of what is still there. You can kind of see that still. Um, what you can also see is that some 
as you walk around the area, the, some of that external wall is still visible and it is now the boundary walls of a lot of these large private buildings. Um, but also something that is still there, we'll move on, is the bear pit. Um, now the bear pit was built at the time of the zoological gardens, but it did over the years fall into a lot of disrepair. Now in, 18, in 1968, it was restored and today this is owned by Leeds Civic Trust and they're the ones taking care of it. So I fully expect it to last an awful lot longer. Um, but that in essence is the story of the zoological and the botanical gardens of Leeds. Um, short lived, um, kind of fault failed because of its own restrictions. Um, otherwise, maybe we could have had our own version, Leeds version of Kew Gardens sat right right close to the city centre. Okay, I'm just going to briefly talk about one of the map. I know Anthony covered Ordnance Survey maps in the beginning and our huge collection, and it is an enormous collection. Um, we're constantly trying to find room to put them because we're still collecting them. But this is the 1850 Ordnance Survey map. This is one of, this is the first Ordnance Survey map of Leeds. Now, they didn't start making them to the 1850s and they didn't do the whole of the country. They only did certain towns. Leeds was very lucky in that we got a map. Um, and I say lucky because they're so useful for, for placing people who appear on the 1851 sentence, census. Um, this map is displayed at five foot to a mile. Um, it's really interesting when you get up close because you can see in the churches, it shows the individual seating. It'll show the location of the altars but they're so good if you're a family historian and you're looking up your family, because once you have an address, you can then look around the area. You can look at the local schools, you can look at the local churches, and then you can delve into their records because that's where your ancestors may have appeared. And if nothing else, you can have a good guess at where their local pub was and where they would go for a cheeky pint. So with that, I am going to hand over to, I will stop sharing my screen and I will hand over to my colleague, Josh. Thanks, Louise. Yep. Sorry, I'll start sharing my screen. So I hope you can all hear me okay. And, and can you just confirm, Lou, that you can see this? Uh, yeah. Perfect. I can see you perfectly. Brilliant. Okay, so, okay, thank you all for sticking around for this bit. Um, this is on Armley in the Industrial Revolution, A Tale of Two Roads, and I'm Josh Flint. Um, so let's get started. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at Armley, 200 years of Armley maps and chart how the Industrial Revolution changed Armley over those 200 years. But what we're going to look at in particular is the impact that the under Industrial Revolution had on two roads in Armley, Armley Ridge Road and Stanningley Road. And to do this, we're going to look at four different maps. The first one is the 1703 Cook's map, map of Armley, which is the first map that we have in our collection, which just shows Armley. And then we're going to jump to 1834 for the Baines and Newsom map of the borough, and we're going to look at the Armley section of that map. And then we're going to use our first Ordnance Survey map of Armley from 1850. And then finally, we're going to look at the 1909 Ordnance Survey map of Armley to see how things have changed in the past 200 years. And how to research for this talk, I did look at the maps, obviously, because uh, it's a map talk, but I use other, other, other parts of our collections as well. And I must just give a shout out to Armley Through the Ages, which is a fantastic book, book about Armley, um, the history of Armley by the Armley Society. If you have any interest in Armley history or any interest in kind of leads in the Industrial Revolution time, uh, time period, read this book. It's absolutely wonderful. So let's get started with our first map. So our first map is the 1703 map of Armley by John Crooks. And as I previously mentioned, this is the first map that we have in our collection, which just solely focuses on Armley. And the reason why I really, this is one of my favorite maps in our collection. And the reason why it is, is because it tells us so much by actually telling us so little. Um, so you look at this map and you can see houses, you can see roads, but there isn't really much else on this map. And I think to me, that tells me that Armley at this point was very ruralized. It was kind of still in the hands of the, the, the manor lords to a certain extent, and it was mainly used for farmland. Um, and that's kind of what Armley, I envisage Armley, and that's what my research into Armley kind of tells me that's what Armley was like in the early 18th century. Um, but this kind of brings me on to quite nicely, one of my favorite inquiries that we've ever had in the Leeds Central Library in the local family history department, and it's all revolves around 
this house right here. So a customer came into the local and family history department and asked to look at this map. And she grabbed me at one point, you know, nicely. She grabbed me nicely. And she said, I think this is my house. And I was like, oh, wonderful. You know, you must be living a very, very big house. Um, and she said, this is, I think this is definitely my house. And, I, and so because that's my house, this road here must be Stanningley Road. This road must be Stanningley Road. I want you to prove that this is or isn't my house. And so like whenever we get a really kind of juicy inquiry in the local family history department, we always kind of, you know, um, we can't wait to get started. And so after much discussions with my colleagues and kind of looking through some of our collections, we kind of had to think, how on earth did we prove that this is or isn't this, this customer's house? And we came to the conclusion that what we had to do, we had to prove, we had to see when Stanningley Road was first built because if it wasn't built until after 1703, then that's in, then it can't be this person's house. After much kind of looking through our collections and looking through maps, we realized that Stanningley Road wasn't built until about 1793, well, between 1793 and about 1830, it was built between that time period. And that actually makes a lot of sense because Stanningley Road is a road which now connects, Leeds, uh, connects Armley to Leeds and Bradford which is very important for trade links now, but actually in 1703, was it that important for Armley to be connected to Leeds and Bradford? And actually it wasn't. And so I think personally that this road here is Armley Ridge Road, which makes a lot more sense because Armley Ridge Road connects Armley to the neighboring villages of Armley, such as Wortley, Morley, Farsley. And it was much more important for Armley in 1703 to be connected to those neighboring villages for, for trade links and just to kind of make sure that every, every those other villages were connected together. It was much less important for Armley to be connected to the big cities or the burgeoning cities around it. Um, so I was pretty convinced that this is Armley Ridge Road. And also through the research, I realized that Armley Ridge Road was actually there in 1703, which is a very, very useful fact to say. And so I called up the customer and I kind of said, you know, I'm really sorry, but this it doesn't look as if this is going to be your road mainly because Stanley Road wasn't there in, in, in 1703. And the customer was very gracious, even though we just kind of wiped 100 years worth of value off the house. Um, and but she said she had thought this might be Armley Ridge Road. But the reason why she didn't think it was is because Armley Ridge Road is a very northwest facing road, where this road here is a very west facing road. And which is what Stanley Road does. And so I, I kind of, I, I got off the phone with the customer and, and I just remember thinking, she's right. She's completely right. This is the, the way that this road is on this map doesn't really match the way that we think Armley Ridge Road is today. So I must admit, we're a bit frustrated, me and, me and some of my colleagues. And so we went back to the map and we went, went back to the collections and we knew we were so certain that this must be Armley Ridge Road, but how could we prove it? it doesn't quite look as if it's in the right place and then as with most of local history normally the simplest answer is the is the correct one and we realized that the compass on this map isn't facing directly north it's slightly skewed northwest and so when you put the map completely north now the the the, the angle that the road is on now matches what we think Armley Road should look like or what we expect Armley Ridge Road to look like. And so now everything kind of falls into place. And so one little tip for when you're using maps in the future is that make sure you get them the right way up. Um, even if the map isn't, you know, even if you have to kind of slant it and make sure the compass is the right way up because it does really help. But what this really did is that I, I, I'm a, I'm, I live in Armley and I use Stanningley Road every single day. And Stanningley Road to me is a, such an important road you know it has the connections to Leeds and Bradford and, and so on and I never imagined that Armley Ridge Road was so important and so it led me to this question of when did that change happen when did Armley Ridge Road stop being important or stop being as important as it used to be historically and when did Stanningley Road start to take that importance and that's what we're going to look at for the, with the next couple of maps so now we're going to go 130 years into the future to the 1834 Baines and Newsom map of the borough, and we're going to focus on the Armley section. And you can see the dramatic change that's happened to Armley as the industrial, industrial revolution is starting to take hold. And what we can see is how Armley is starting to become more built up. It's got more houses, 
we still have the grand manor houses like Armley House there, um, but we're starting to see how mills are starting to become really important and how industry is starting to really knit Armley together through places like Armley Mills. But what about Stanningley Road? The reason why I chose this map is because this is the first map that we have that really labels Stanningley Road. And uh, interestingly, this map here doesn't, it, uh, Stanningley Road is on it, but it's, it's kind of plotted on it as if it's still being constructed to a certain extent. Um, where you look at Armley Ridge Road here, and that's a fully formed road, where Stanningley Road is still looks as if it's still being created. And I think that kind of tells me that in 1834, even though Armley was wanting to look to places like Bradford and Leeds for more trade, it was also very, very important. It was still connected to the neighboring villages and towns such as Wortley and Morley and Barnsley. And we'll see how that changes over the next few maps. Um, but you can already see the dramatic change in the 130 years from 1703 to 1834. And then we go to our first ordnance survey map of Armley in 1850. Now you're probably thinking, why did I choose two maps that are so close together in date? And the reason why is because you can see from the difference of these two maps how Armley changed in those 15 to 16 years. It's 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 a bit ludicrous how much it's changed. You know, it's it's getting more built up. There's more industry. There's more mills. There's more tanneries. You can see the railway lines really starting start starting to um, take hold. You can see the canal being a very important place. You can see the roads really starting to be um, take hold and what I noticed from this map more than anything is that because you're seeing more houses, more industry, um, more links to everywhere else, people are moving to Armley and living there for pretty much their entire lives. And if you do that, you need to start creating things like schools. You know, in, and if you're creating schools, then people are being educated in Armley, they're working in Armley, and then unfortunately, as what happens to everyone, they're dying in Armley as well. And that's why you see the, the, the creation of Armley Cemetery. So you, people are living there for their entire life and they're containing their entire life there because you've seen that they're born, they're educated, they're working there through the mills, they're living there through the houses and they end up dying there as well. Um, but what about Stanningley Road and Armley Ridge Road? And this map is really important when looking at those two roads because now you can see the impact that Stanningley Road is kind of is having on the landscape of Armley you can see how it's kind of cutting Armley in half to a certain extent. It's, it's going straight through the center of Armley um, and it's now a fully formed created road. And you can still see Armley Ridge Road just here as well, just kind of going straight down the middle of Armley, just here. And you can see how those two roads are highlighted pretty much exactly the same as or, or highlighted in importance exactly the same on this map and that's the last map that I've seen that highlights them in a very similar way because by the time you get to the 1909 ordnance survey map of Armley the thing that grabs your attention straight away is how the road of Stanningley Road is just almost all-encompassing for Armley at this point it's been extended it's been widened it's now the main trade links that Armley has to the big cities which it had to have for trade industry resources um, where Armley Ridge Road even though it's obviously still plotted is starting to become less important the what's happening to Stanley Road where it's being extended it's being kind of cultivated to a certain extent it's being used a lot more and that's what we see for the next few well the next hundred years as well to the modern day Stanley Roads the importance is becoming more and more apparent as we did with all the other maps, it's always quite nice to see what's new on this map compared to the others. So we've already got the houses, we've already got the um, the mills, we've got the hospitals, we've got the schools, we've got the cemeteries. But what I notice on this map, which I hadn't seen before, is football grounds and cricket grounds. And I think that what that shows to me is that in the very, very limited amount of time that people had for recreational activity outside of work, they were having places to go. They could go and watch football teams. They could go and watch cricket teams. They could go and play there. Um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that everything was all nice and easy in 1909 Armley because the workhouse is kind of a looming presence over this period that, you know, there was still great amount of poverty in Armley in that time period. Um, but yeah, so 
it's just been a very kind of whistle-stop tour into how Armley changed during the Industrial Revolution and how that's kind of can be seen through the, what's happened with these two roads, that the importance of Armley Ridge Road is completely different from 1703 to 1909. And the greater importance and emphasis is placed on Stanley Road just keeps on becoming more and more apparent. And even now, you know, you, walk, you go for Armley now and you can still see how they're starting to, you know, widen the road and make it, make Stanley Road more accessible for everyone. Um, so I'm gonna leave with one last vision which is an aerial view of Armley from 1963. And I love this photograph. I, I think it's a wonderful photograph of Armley, but it does kind of strike me as, I just wish we could have seen an aerial view of Armley from 1703, but I don't know about you, but I don't think it's gonna happen. So yeah, so thank you all for coming and I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm gonna pass over to Helen now. Hi Josh, thank you for that. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, so I'm Helen Skilbeck, I'm the Librarian in Local and Family History, and I've got a few uh, maps to show you uh, that you may not have seen in our collection before. And this first one is from 1971, and it's a Soviet map. And we actually have most of Leeds uh, in this map. Um, it's split into four quarters, though. So it is um, dissecting the city centre. And you may notice that this map is entirely in Russian. So uh, if I highlight a few bits here, we have Armley, we have Wortley, and down at the bottom here, we have Beeston Hill. Now the uh, area it covers, the city centre is the very top right of your screen and you'll see that the, the river and the canal are flowing through this image as well uh, near the train station too. Uh, here's an enlargement of it for you to have a look at. Now these maps are quite mysterious. We don't know how we got hold of these ones and it's not really known how many exist. What we do know is that Stalin began a secret Soviet mapping project that lasted 50 years and attempted to map most of the world. And it's been estimated that over a million maps were created in total. The maps were very detailed, and certainly the ones of UK locations look very similar to our Ordnance Survey map. In fact, they're most probably based on the Ordnance Survey map, but also uh, I think they use satellite imagery as well as possibly people on the ground. So possibly some secret agents going around um, making some mapping decisions. Certainly some maps from different parts of the country would um, say how much weight a, a bridge could bear uh, or how fast flowing a river was. And that's the kind of detail you can't really get just from satellite imagery or ordnance survey maps. So on this map, um, as I was saying, this is the, the city centre, the western part of it. You might recognise some buildings. This highlighted building here in purple is actually Leeds Town Hall, so right next to the Leeds Central Library. And this um, building is actually the old post office on City Square. Uh, if you look carefully, you may see that there are numbers attached to these. So the Town Hall is 87 and the post office is number 86. And alongside these maps, we have a list of all the buildings and they're numbered and they're listed as important objects. And they're mainly buildings concerned with military or communications or governmental or administrative buildings. Um, so there's a theory that these were maybe drawn off as some kind of secret invasion maps with all the important parts of the city marked out. Now, I don't think this map's hugely accurate because um, it has got Wellington Station marked on here and that closed in about 1938 and this map was um, dated as 1971 so it's not quite up to date but there are fascinating maps to look at to see how um, the Russians plotted Leeds. Uh, they also have a big description of what Leeds was like all in Russian and also a street uh, index in Russian as well for these maps. 
So anyone that reads Russian, you're very welcome to come and visit and, and have a look through these wonderful maps. Uh, there is actually a book called Red Atlas by John Davis and Alexander Kent, who have written all about these maps and it's full of illustrations of them from um, all around the world, the various different ones that were mapped. So that's our first map. The next one is, it's really a whole genre of maps and it's the Goad Fire Insurance map. And we have quite a lot of these in stock and we still receive regular updated versions for various areas of Leeds. And the older maps are bound in huge volumes like this one. Uh, you may be able to see my, my hands just at the very edges, showing the context, the size of them. Now, gold maps are detailed street maps showing buildings and their uses and date back to the latter part of the 19th century. Charles E. Goad first produced them, so they are still known as gold maps. And they were done to aid insurance companies in assessing fire risk. So the maps show what buildings were used for what materials they were made from, how many stories high they were, where the nearest hydrants were situated. They're actually full of abbreviations and they're color coded. So you might be able to see the pink color on the map stands for brick, stone or concrete buildings. The yellow refers to wooden buildings and the blue is for skylights on various um, height buildings. There's also, um, abbreviations and imagery for the different types of boilers used, for chimneys, for hydrants and sprinklers as well. So I've got some parts of the maps highlighted. This one is actually of the Leeds Central Library and the Art Gallery. So you'll see there's a lot of pink for the, the brick or stone buildings. There's a lot of blue for the Art Gallery, especially with the skylights letting in light for the galleries. And this was a period where there was an open yard at the back of the library. So you'll see this white patch in the middle where 142 is written and that's open space, so no buildings there at all. And there are patches of wood on the library building. You see these yellow squares that refers to wooden parts of the building. And if you look carefully on the western side of the building, it says police offices. So this map would have been a period from the 1930s to the 1960s where Leeds City Police Force were based in the Central Library. This is a, an example of the Grand Theatre area on these maps. So again, a lot of pink for the stone or brick, a lot of blue for the skylights. You can also see various other things mentioned. So uh, you can see sprinklers are mentioned. There's an iron and asbestos curtain. There are four tiers of wooden galleries, uh, stone stairs, but also to the right of the Grand Theatre, you might be able to see there's a, a blue and yellow structure here. And it actually says sunk petrol tank next door. So um, all these things would be taken into account by insurance agencies to assess the risk to these buildings. The fire brigades would also have copies, which would help them prepare for what may await them in case of fire. Uh, for example, any chemical hazards or how many people might be present in the building or so on. We also have more recent GOAD maps. So this is an example from the 1970 map of Leeds City Centre. And I've just enlarged it a little bit here for you. You do need a magnifying glass when you do look at it in person as well, because some of the writing is absolutely tiny. Now, these later maps don't give all the building materials detail and they're black and white, so they don't look as pretty. They give the names of the shops and their type of trade. So you may be able to make out some familiar names on this map. There's Schofields at the top left, there's Boots the Chemist, there's uh, Woolworths and Marks and Spencers, and Littlewoods is still under construction at this point. And um, we have them for various areas of Leeds. So any built up retail areas, such as Headingley, the Otley Road area, Round Hay Road in Hare Hills, Crossgate Shopping Centre, Horsforth Town Street, really. And they're 
we get them every kind of couple of years. So they're great for reminiscence work or for seeing what used to be somewhere. And the British Library have actually digitized a lot of the early GOAD maps from around the country and you can see them online. Um, I was gonna put a link in the chat, that's not working, but if you Google search British Library, fire insurance maps, I'm sure you'll be able to find them. Now, the last map I wanted to mention is uh, from the 1850 time period, and it's known colloquially in our department as the murder map. And an, it's an example of a map drawn up for a very specific purpose. And it was a prosecutor's map and was used in the trial of William Higgins and six other people to show various locations connected to the murder of a local man, Joseph Rhodes. And it covers the area to the east of the city centre around York Street, Shannon Street and Marsh Lane. And I'll just show you an enlargement of part of it. Now, the Leeds Intelligencer newspaper tells us what happened. And just to warn you, the language it uses is very anti-Irish. So Higgins is an Irishman and along with two of his Irish friends had a quarrel with an Englishman called John Ackroyd. And this continued over several days apparently, but on Saturday the 16th of November, 1850, Higgins and friends visited the Forester's Arms pub on Cleveland Street. And they attacked a man there called Joseph Horner with bludgeons and pokers, possibly mistaking him for Ackroyd who they'd argued with. They left the pub saying they would return later with more people and a small mob was formed. Joseph Rhodes, who lived nearby, was out walking with his 10-year-old son at this time and came face to face with the mob on Shannon Street. It was said that Higgins threw a brick at Rhodes and it hit him on the head and he was knocked unconscious. He was picked up and taken to a nearby house and then to the infirmary, but he died a few days later. The mob then returned to the Forester's Arms but found it closed. They smashed some windows and visited another pub in Lewis's Arms on York Street, where they caused more damage and stole the takings from the till. Later that night, two police officers were seriously injured trying to break up the mob. So this map shows where um, all these altercations took place. Um, it's kind of East Leeds area around what was known as the Bank, which had a large population of Irish immigrants and it has the Forester's Arms marked at the far right here. And the location where Joseph Rhodes was knocked down is also marked. The um, Lewis's Arms is off to the far left of the map. Now we've got just a couple of newspaper reports at the time. Um, they talk of the Irish rioting, another fearful outrage by Irishmen. Um, Higgins and another man were eventually found guilty of manslaughter rather than murder, and they were sentenced to be transported for 10 years. So that's just a quick pour through some of the different types of maps that we have, some drawn up for very specific purposes, um, but they're all fascinating to look at in their own right. I'm going to finish up there, and I think we are coming to the end of the session. So just to make sure you're aware that the local and family history library is on the second floor of central library we're currently still closed but we're hoping next month we may be able to reopen um, but in the meantime you can contact us by email you can um, telephone and leave a voicemail and we'll phone you back and we've got um, social media accounts under leeds libraries uh, facebook and twitter and instagram that Louise mentioned earlier, we've got a new Instagram account for uh, the Leodis website, which is on the screen, Leodis by Leeds Library. So if you are interested in our photographic collection as well, please do follow us on there. So I'm going to hand back to Louise now, and she's going to go through any questions yeah. you have had for us. And we do have some. Um, so obviously all four of us are on screen, um, with the exception of Anthony, whose camera is still not working, but he is there. Um, so first of all, we had a question from Elaine regarding Garforth Library. Uh, she says that they have a lot of old local maps. Do other local libraries hold maps? Who would like to take that? 
I'm going to ask Helen that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it probably varies a little bit. I know certainly most of them did have their own map collection, but I suspect some of them have been um, sent to us at Central, depending on the space that they now have, as a lot of libraries have been turned into community hubs, some of the floor space has been lost. So it's worth checking with your local library to see if they have still got them uh, in store. If not, then we should have them all for the whole of the Leeds area at Central. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that people realise maps take up so much room and there's only certain ways you can store them, um, but they are, they are big eaters of floor space. Okay, um, this is a question for Anthony from Janet. On the riot map that you showed, the first slide showed New Roadside and Broadway in Horsforth. Was there a riot there? Uh, no, no, it, it's actually a, a, um, part, a civil war uh, battle at White Coat, Newley Bridge, which must be just below Horsforth, sort of around Bramley area. I, I miss um, attributed it to, to being uh, the, the battle on, on Brigate when I was speaking, but it, if you actually go to the Riot Maps website, it, it is referring to this other this other battle. Um, so yeah, I don't, I've looked, I've had a good look through the website, and there were there were no riots in the yeah. at least on that website anyway in the in the um, area itself. Yeah, the the web address for that is www.leadsriotmap.co.uk. So anyone can view that. Just need an internet connection. So yeah. Um, Okay, this is something Alan raised about my bit, the zoological and biological gardens. He said that there is a huge section on the headingleyleads.com website where you can read a lot more about it. Um, and that is a good reminder that a lot of areas in Leeds have their own local history groups. Um, May is local history month, um, a local and community history month. And so it's always worth checking just through Google if your area has a local and community history group because they quite often have online platforms where they show off their stuff. Um, just another one about the zoological garden. Siobhan questioned, was surprised at the power of religious observance outweighing the prospects of money making um, and working class employment. Um, mm. Now I, I can remember when the supermarkets first started opening on a Sunday and that was just heavily questioned about whether or not things should open and that was sort of in my lifetime, but it seems so strange now because everything is accessible on a Sunday. Um, okay, so I'll ask this one to Anthony. This was an anonymous question. Does the 1850 Ordnance Survey map show Hunslet? Uh, I presume that is referring to the, the five foot uh, town plan rather than yeah. the, yeah. Well, I'm actually looking at it now and um, it, yeah, um, it, it not not quite. It it's got the very top of Hunslet, um, like parts of Jack Lane, um, and certainly Holbeck, but not um, not all of. It doesn't go like into Hunslet proper by the looks of it. But I have to I have to say the file size is so large that I'm not entirely convinced yeah. the whole image is properly loaded on my screen. <laughs> so the very bottom of it might be cut off. Right. We, um, the best thing to do, I guess, would be to come in and have a look at it yeah. at some point once, once mm -hmm. that's an option. Okay, Josh, I've got a couple of Armley questions for you. One from mm -hmm. Linda, who is on the edge of her seat. You never said, was the lady's house identified? Um, <laughs> yes. No, sorry, no. Um, no, it wasn't identified because um, I think after I got, after I called up and said, actually, instead of your house being 300 years old, it was 150 or less. Um, I think it kind of burst a bubble and she didn't really ask us to go into more into more detail about kind of where her house is or where, what it was on historical maps or anymore. Um, okay. But her house was, we, I think it was kind of, I'm going to be a kind of, I don't want to give her a dress away, but very close to where the entrance is to the Armley Golf Course around that area there with all those kind of quite grand houses and stuff. Okay. Jane said it was a fascinating piece on Armley there, so well done. Um, she was just wondering, in 1700, um, Armley Ridge Road, she said, led to a wyther and then via wyther Lane to Leeds and Bradford Road, when that was the main route between the two towns. So was the Stanningley Road really needed? Probably not. And I, and I think that that's, that's a really good kind of um, way to see it, is that it wasn't needed in, in the early 18th century and even up until the mid 
mid um, to early parts of the 19th century. And, but once the Industrial Revolution kind of started to take hold, they needed faster links. And I think yeah. that's what Standing the Road offers. And that's why it became becomes yeah. more and more important as time goes on. But that's, it is a very straight road. It's a very straight road. Very straight, very direct. Yeah. It's when okay, you look um, at a map and it just cuts it in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> just to quickly go back to the does the 1850 map show Hunslet, Karen has popped a note and I'm assuming it's Karen who works in local and family history and knows everything. Um, she's popped a note to say that in the Q&A today she thinks it does so she <laughs> does think um, Hunslet is on there. Um, another question then, uh, is there an A to Z of Leeds that is pre-1930s showing the pre-slum clearances of the city. Do we have anything like that? Uh, Anthony has unmuted um, himself. There's, well, there's that Roberts, um, is it Roberts, that A to Z thing? It's Atlas and Guide to Leeds, which is from around that time, like the 1930s. Yeah. And we often use it for sort of that purpose because it includes a lot of streets that have since disappeared, but that maybe isn't exactly pre the period that we're talking about. Right. That's the closest okay. I can think of. Right. Um, Elizabeth would like to know, is it possible to buy copies of any of the maps? Now, mm. I know that a while ago we were selling them, but then I think the people who were producing them stopped. Um, do we know of anywhere else where you can buy sets of maps of Leeds like we used to sell? No. <laughs> no, sorry, no. no. I mean, we uh, we, we ran out of yeah. the ones yeah. that were produced in a lovely tube where you got lots of lovely copies of various um, periods. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can really make close. copies of our maps or we can send out ones. Um, and then when we're open again, you can obviously come in and, and look at everything. Um, you can buy from commercial... Um, websites maps of leeds there's an old map website uh, but you can look at a lot of the ordnance survey maps through the national library of scotland's website uh, so you can view a lot of them online um, but we don't sell any ourselves at all who was it that produced the selection of maps that we used to sell you remember it was was it a combination of thorsby society yeah. and Yorkshire Evening Post, possibly. Yeah. We'll have to get a message to the Thorsby Society that they should do that again. There is still time. <laughs> well, actually, um, funnily enough, they are talking about it at the moment about doing something similar. So watch this space. Yeah. If you hadn't, if you hadn't guessed, Anthony is part of the Thorsby Society, so that was a quite <laughs> weighted hint that I sent you from there. Um, Siobhan just says this has been very interesting. Thank you so much. It's been lovely to um, hear our enthusiasm and the knowledge that we have. Um, let me see what else we've got. Jackie does say, I'm assuming she's referring to Stanningley Road. She says it is really fast these days. Um, <sighs> there, yeah? Rarely fast these days. Rarely which is, fast. Yeah. Oh, rarely fast these yeah. days. Yeah, rarely fast these yeah. days. Even, even, even at like midnight, it's still jammed and it's just, oh. yeah. anyway. <laughs> I can remember when they brought in the um, two plus occupation lane and oh, the, the <laughs> scandal then, the shouting then. <laughs> okay, yeah. Jackie also points out the National Library of Scotland do sell um maps off their website the reason i'm making all saying all of these things out loud is because i'm aware the chat isn't working and you can't all see the q a so um alan says that alan godfrey maps sell early os maps um and then karen also says there's older leads in maps in a folder on amazon and abe books so there you go um so yeah that seems to be all we have for questions and then sally says another great talk thanks all so you're very welcome um i'll just say a couple of final things well i'm going to stop the recording now so 